Good afternoon. As is our tradition, we gather today to remember Robert E. Lee, who served from 1865 until his death in October 1870 as the 11th president of what was to become Washington and Lee University. And being an academic institution, it is fitting that we commemorate Lee's memory in a scholarly manner. So we welcome today as our speaker, Jeffrey D. Wirt, a respected historian and author who has written extensively on the Civil War especially the Eastern Theater. After receiving a BA from Lock Haven University and an MA from the Pennsylvania State University, Mr. Work taught history for over 30 years at Penns Valley Area High School. For many years, he has contributed articles, reviews, and columns for publications including Virginia Cavalcade, American History Illustrated, and Civil, Time, uh, Civil War Times Illustrated. Mr. Wirt was also an associate editor and contributor to the Historical Times Illustrated Encyclopedia of the Civil War. He serves on the Historical Advisory Board of the Gettysburg Foundation and is a member of the Honorary Board of Trustees of the Civil War Preservation Trust. Mr. Wirt is the author of nine books, including Cavalry of the Lost Cause, a biography of Jeb Stewart, James, uh, General James Longstreet, the Confederacy's most controversial soldier, and the Sword of Lincoln, the Army of the Potomac. He has received several literary awards and was nom nominated for a National Book Award and a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Gettysburg, Day Three. His most recent book is A Glorious Army, Robert E. Lee's Triumph, 1862 to 1863 for which he has received a National Book Award nomination and the Richard B. Harwell Award from the Atlanta Civil War Roundtable. The book has been described as a fresh assessment of Lee and has been praised as a page turner and an essential read for both Civil War history fans and scholars. We are most fortunate to have him here today to speak on Lee and the rebirth of an army from seven days to Gettysburg. Please help me welcome Jeffrey D. Wirt. Good afternoon. As uh, you heard Pat say, I'm a retired high school history teacher. And if any of you are high school history teachers, you know how precious questions are. So uh, we are going to allow time for questions and I'd be more than happy to try to answer any. Or if you disagree with what I'm about to say, I would be happy to hear that too. So uh, please. General Robert E. Lee, rode out Nine Mile Road from Richmond to assume temporary command of the Army of Northern Virginia on Sunday, June 1st, 1862. Uh, the previous night at uh, Fair Oaks or Seven Pines, uh, the Army Commander Joseph E. Johnson was seriously wounded. And so in the course of that evening, uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, with frankly little choice, uh, turned to Lee and offered him temporary command of the Army in Northern Virginia. What is interesting about that at the time, Lee's reputation was not very good. Uh, he had a wonderful Virginia lineage, uh, but in the fall of 1861, Lee had led Confederate troops in a campaign in Western Virginia. A combination of subordinates who were rather fought with each other than the Yankees, uh, troops that were poorly disciplined, poorly armed, and bad weather, the campaign failed. And Richmond newspapers criticized Lee. They said he was timid. In fact, he even argued that he was afraid to fight the enemy. They started to call him Granny Lee. After that, Lee was uh, moved to the South Atlantic coast where he oversaw the construction of fortifications. And then in March of 1862, Davis brought Lee back uh, to Richmond uh, to act as his military advisor. So Lee was acting in that capacity when these events transpired and he was given temporary command of what he would soon christen the Army of Northern Virginia. But his reputation still was there. There was questions, of, to be frank about it, within Richmond and within the Army. Now I will tell you what's curious though, 
George B. McClellan, who would be his opponent immediately, he wrote a letter home that when he heard that Lee had replaced Johnson, he was pleased with that. Because he said that Lee is timid and he would most likely not be very aggressive. Uh, there is, as you know, well know, a lot of irony in those, that letter. But an interesting conversation did occur within the first few days uh, that has become rather famous uh, in that regard. And that was from E. Porter Alexander, who was ordnance officer for, in the Army. And Alexander was talking to Major Joseph Ives of uh, Davis's staff. And Alexander was expressing, I think, the same kind of thing that this Granny Lee idea was. And he said, well, the only way the Confederacy is going to win this war is we have to have someone who has audacity, who is willing to be aggressive and bold. And he asked Ives, well, what do you think of the General Lee? And this is what Ives said in return. Alexander, if there is any man in either army, federal and Confederate, who is head and shoulders far above every other one in either army in audacity, that man is General Lee. And you will very soon have lived to see it. Lee is audacity personified. His name is audacity. And you need not to be afraid of not seeing all of it that you will want to see. Well, it certainly reassured Alexander, but, but there was this uncertainty, as I said. And the army that Lee came to, uh, Joseph Johnston had good attributes as a general. Uh, he was popular, uh, but he was a poor administrator. So they were poorly equipped, they were ill-armed, they were certainly ill-disciplined. Uh, uh, D.H. Hill, who would tended to grumble about most things, uh, wrote a letter to his wife and said that, you know, thousands of men are in Richmond, they're not even with their, their regiments, uh, you know, they're in there drinking and cavorting and things like that, and we have to impose discipline. Uh, so all these things. But yet at the same time, and I thought about this, as Lee rode out that Sunday morning, you think about it. I know it's not something an historian should say as such, but did not the stars align for the Confederacy? Because waiting for him were senior subordinates, James Longstreet, Jeb Stewart, D.H. Hill, A.P. Hill, Lafayette McLaws, Richard Anderson. In the valley here, you had Stonewall Jackson and Richard S. Ewell. At brigade command, you had the promises of a John Bell Hood and a Jubal Early and a William Dorsey Pender. And if you looked at the Army of the Potomac, who were just miles away, you simply don't see that talent. And so Lee, who will come to this army, who has to discipline them and mold them. But what is waiting for him not only is this town and officers, but there's something else I don't think you can really measure. You can, you can see it once they engage, but there was something about the men in the ranks. They had a fighting spirit or their land for battle that was nowhere else. D.H. Hill will eventually say they're that incomparable infantry. And they were just waiting for somebody. They had sort of, they had shown uh, glimpses of it certainly at Williamsburg on May the 5th and then at Seven Pines and Fair Oaks. And what does Lee do? Lee immediately does what he will do for the next three years. He goes to work. And the surprising thing is in about two days time after talking to some of the officers, Lee decides that they have to take the offensive against the Army of Potomac that's lying outside the gates of Richmond. <clears throat> During the winter of 1862, uh, the Confederate administration and War Department adopted somewhat to be a passive defensive strategy. Well, what did that lead to? In Tennessee, the Federal Army captured Forts Henry and Donelson. They occupied Nashville. They occupied Memphis. In April, you had the terribly bloody Battle of Shiloh, which is a Union victory. Towards the end of April, a naval fleet sailed up the Mississippi River and captured the South's largest city, New Orleans. Earlier, you had in incursions along the North Carolina coast at Roanoke Island. And most importantly, perhaps, is the fact that the massive 100,000 man Union Army of Potomac under George McClellan was within a handful of miles from Richmond in June of 1862. 
In fact, the War Department in Washington was so confident of victory that they shut down recruiting offices. The war's soon going to be over. We're going to, McClellan's going to, well, I won't say march into Richmond. He's going to sort of inch his way into Richmond the way they looked at it. And uh, the war will be over. And Lee saw that. And he had thought about that a great deal. And I would argue more probably than anybody at the time. Lee understood that this is a long shadow. It's deepening across the Confederacy. And if something is not done, the Confederacy is doomed. And to Lee, the only thing that they can do is to be audacious, to be bold, to take the offensive. See, Lee understood clearly that the Confederacy could not win a military triumph in the Civil War. And what I mean by that is they're not going to capture the North. They're not going to go into the North and go through Pennsylvania to New York and New England. They're simply not. What they have to win is a political negotiated settlement that grants the Confederacy independence. In other words, the ultimate enemy of the Confederacy were the Northern people and their willingness to sustain the war. In a contest between democratic societies, it is that. Which society will continue to, to uh, uh, you know, go through the sacrifices to lose their husbands, their brothers and son? Will they do that? So to Lee, you either had to shorten the war with a series of victories, or you had to stalemate it long enough to convince the Northern people that you can't conquer us. But you can't sit there like the Confederacy did and wait for it. Because if you do, we're doomed. Because he also realized, too, that at some point, and he looked at the odds against them, at some point, Lincoln's going to find a man who is going to unsheathe that northern sword of manpower and might. And when they do, the Confederacy's probably finished. So to Lee, boldness was the only course. Now, I will tell you, he had a, by accounts, he, he certainly had a combative personality. Uh, one Texan soldier would later liken him to a gamecock. I don't know if that's exactly fair, Lee. But if you read Lee's reports and stuff, what's interesting, when he went into battle, he just didn't want to win. He wanted to destroy, he wanted to crush, and he wanted to wipe out his enemies. Those are his words in his reports. The other thing about it is, as Lee looked at this, he wanted to do it if he could by maneuver, uh, particularly a, a broad strategic turning movement, which you're, many of you are familiar with, that he'll use, and on a battlefield, if you will, a more tactical turning movement. But if he could maneuver the enemy into such a position where he could inflict a, uh, a crippling wound in part of it, that was his goal. So we come to the seven days. So by the end of June, Lee does take the offensive. It's an interesting campaign in the sense if you look at it, and we tend to forget it with Lee, but it's important. It does begin as a campaign of maneuver. Uh, they try to, you know, he, the, he's going to attack part of the Northern Union Army north of the Chickahominy River while the bulk of the Union Army is south of it, and he's hoping that McClellan won't push through the thinly held lines that Lee leaves behind south. It's, it's bold by its very nature. He takes 55,000 men north of the Chickahominy to attack, leaves 25,000 to face 70,000. But he found the weakest element. And he would attack three times in the Seven Days Campaign. He'll attack at Gaines Mill, where the opportunity came to, well, uh, day earlier at Mechanicsville, but that's a bungle of miscommunication and mistakes. He attacks at Gaines Mill because he believes he has to. He has to keep McClellan's attention north of the river. They will attack June 30th at Glendale, where he had an opportunity to cut in half the Union retreat and probably destroy the Army of Potomac or a major element of it. And then you come, if you think about it, to Malvern Hill on July the 1st. Malvern Hill, as D.H. Hill wrote about, it was not war, it was murder. It's a Confederate tragedy. Sixteen brigades, one after another, went up that slope and were slaughtered. And it was a mistake. And by that, what I mean is Lee was ready to cancel the attack. He was on the left 
front of the army with James Longstreet in the, late in the afternoon of July the 1st. And he could see the crest of Malvern Hill and the rows of Union cannon and infantry up there. And he received two pieces of information that were wrong. One was that the Federal Army was in retreat. Well, it wasn't in retreat. They were shifting troops. But see, to Lee, what had he had done for the past six days? He had been trying to capture the Federal Army on retreat and destroying elements of it. And the other one was that they had made a favorable advance. Confederate unions had made favorable advances against that. That was wrong, too. So Lee orders an assault based upon two pieces of information that were wrong. The seven days Lee would ride after under ordinary circumstances, the Union Army should have been destroyed. But the fact of the matter is uh, the Army didn't work well in the seven days. Uh, Porter Alexander would write later that an army is like a machine and sometimes it clangs. Well, during the seven days, the Army of Northern Virginia clanged. Uh, Stonewall Jackson had a performance that I will be frank about Lee was bitterly disappointed in. He could not understand it, but I do accept uh, the consensus of most historians who try to understand it, that there must have been this physical and mental exhaustion on the part of Jackson. What I've always thought is remarkable about Jackson, I have not read of any general in the Civil War, truthfully. Well, Grant comes to mind in a sense, but in another element, how Jackson could will unwilling men to do things. You know, if you remember in April of 1862, he writes to his wife here in the valley that he liked to create an army of the living God. And I believed every word of that. The problem always was that he commanded a lot of sinners. So you have to go and you have to force these men to do things. And he did. And by imposing his will on his men who did not want it imposed upon, he imposed his will upon his opponents. Jackson was a relentless warrior. But in the seven days, even uh, Robert K. Crick, who probably knows more about the Army of Northern Virginia than any man who maybe ever lived, had to admit that Jackson didn't do much. And Lee saw that and didn't, you know, he was bitterly, according to his staff officers. But most importantly, folks, the seven days is a major turning point in the war. I know we don't look at, we always think of Antietam and Gettysburg. But the fact of the matter is, it was. Lee takes, well, first importantly, the Army of Potomac is driven away from Richmond. Lee will tell Charles Marshall that the best defense of Richmond is to always have the Army of Northern Virginia as far away from Richmond as we could have it. So that is on the ground that. But what is, Lee now owns the battlefields in the east. Lee is going to keep what is called the strategic or operational initiative for roughly the next two years. Lee is going to shape the contours of a campaign. Lee is going to find the battlegrounds. Now there are going to be a couple weeks in Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville where his opponent is going to initiate and have the initiative, but Lee will always get it back. The war in the East changes after seven days. In a month time, Lee recourses and his army the conflict in the East. There's always been an argument among historians, and it still is, where did the Confederacy lose the war? And the consensus is that the Confederacy lost the war in the West, and I think that's right. But my view is that the only place they could have won the war was in the East. That is the nerve center beside Washington, it's also the media center. This is where the, most of the news came from. This is where the pressure could be put in the administration in Washington. And Lee, this is what he had the possibilities of doing. So from the seven days, they turned north into central Virginia. By the way, during the seven days campaign, thousands and thousands of Confederate soldiers straggled. Lee will call it the great curse of the army. Uh, and uh, well, you know, they have a wonderful battlefield discipline. But in camp and on the march, I mean, as much as Lee will try to impose his will on these honorary men, 
It takes time. They're just not going to bend to it. There's so much individualism among them, they're just not. And if they want to walk away for a while, they're going to walk away for a while. And they're going to come back. And that's what happens in the seven days. And as they head north through central Virginia in what is the second Manassas campaign, they're going to straggle more. They're going to start to reach some physical limits, which you should keep in mind. But I can't tell you where. I can't tell you exactly when. But somehow, at some point, the clanging army in northern Virginia became less clanging in the second Manassas campaign. Jackson redeems himself. Isn't it interesting to know that Lee, even though he's disappointed in Jackson, will send Jackson initially to confront Pope? Because Jackson works well, as he knew, independently. But they move to the old killing ground of Manassas. And there, in the words of James Longstreet, if you look at the campaigns of Lee, he considers Second Manassas to be Lee's masterpiece. It is a campaign where he used maneuver, put his army into a position where the Federals were essentially forced to attack, and then at the right moment, Longstreet, in this case, will deliver one of the great counterattacks of the war. I imagine almost everybody's been to First Manassas uh, Battleground. You know, there's Henry House Hill up there and down, down there's that intersection that's always crowded with about 10,000 cars, it seems, but the stone house is there. Well, that intersection today was critical. Had Longstreet been able to push there to that and control that intersection, uh, the Army of Potomac would have been scattered all across Northern Virginia, arguably close to being destroyed. It's a brilliantly conceived and executed campaign by Lee's army. And as I said, Longstreet regarded it as a, Lee's masterpiece. In some ways, I think he's right in that regard. From there, the, Lee decides to take the war north. Now, what's interesting about before he crosses the Potomac River, he writes to Jefferson Davis and asks permission if he can take the army across the river. They'd already started across the river when he wrote the letter. Uh, but he and Davis had a very good relationship, unlike what Davis had had with Joe Johnston. But Lee was smart enough and knew, having worked with Davis, what you had to do with Davis. And he kept him informed. And Davis respected Lee deeply for that. And Lee respected Davis. So they have a very good relationship. Why did they go there? Well, where were they going? Folks, they were going to Pennsylvania. Even Davis had written about in late 61, early 62, that we should carry the war north of the Potomac River. Southern people, you know, we talk about Lee's audacity and boldness and his aggressiveness. Southern people wanted their generals to kill Yankees. It was as simple as that. They wanted them to take the war to them. They didn't want a passive uh, uh, men back here waiting for the Yankees to come into our homeland. No, you take the war to them. And Lee is going to cross the river into uh, Maryland to take the war into Pennsylvania. The problem was, it's an army on the edge now. For the last two months, they've been campaigning hard, particularly coming up in Second Manassas. You have thousands of men who are going to refuse to cross the river for reasons that are, they just can't physically do it. And you're going to have, once they cross into Maryland, an epidemic of straggling. Men are falling out of the ranks, they're gonna go back to Virginia. But it's a boldness of Lee that's still going to take that army there. And of course, as you well know, what happens is that a copy of his orders are found. McClellan reacts. Now, and, you know, I would like to, defend George McClellan briefly. Uh, the defense is usually brief, uh, McClellan. <laughs> but in a sense, so, uh, Lee, by the way, when Lee was asked after the war who was his most ablest opponent, he said McClellan. He didn't say Grant, he said McClellan. McClellan was a gifted organizer, and the Army of Potomac will always be Little Mac's army. There'll be others who come after him, but they're always gonna be Little Mac's army. Uh, but there was always this element about McClellan. He is going, and it's a wonderful weapon. The Army of Potomac is overlooked because of the Army of Northern Virginia in history. That's the way it is. But the Army of Potomac was made up of very good men who become very good soldiers. And this is a marvelous weapon. 
and yet McClellan, it's like he marches the army to the, down a road to a rise. And across the rise, he does not know what's there. And he won't take him over that rise because there's a risk involved. And that's what he does. But when he gets a lost order and he finds it, he acts fairly well, really, folks. Uh, he wants to make sure that it's not a plant. And once he finds out that, yes, the Confederates are marching as the order says they are, he moves. But it's still Lee. Lee could have left Maryland. McClellan would not have captured Lee had Lee chose to leave Maryland. But as Lee will say afterwards, it was better to fight a battle in Maryland as not to. The problem was he is facing an opponent with twice his number. His ranks are probably down to 40,000 men. And as he would say later, September the 17th, 1862 at Antietam or Sharpsburg was indeed the greatest day in the history of the army. What Lee asked his men to do that day was stunning. Think about points in the battle. You know, it's one of these battles that progresses from the morning to the midday to the late afternoon. At late in the morning, in the, around the cornfield in the east and west woods, the Stonewall Division, not brigade, division, was down to 250 men and commanded by a captain. 8,000 men lay killed or wounded in a one mile square area. In the center of Lee's line, when the sunken road of the Bloody Lane collapses and the Federals are storming through Piper's cornfield heading to just destroy the middle of Lee's army, there's James Longstreet and his staff manning cannon. There's D.H. Hill with three or four hundred men, a major general uh, uh, leading a counterattack, because that's all you have in the middle of your line. As the North Carolinian said in the middle of the battle, my God, my God, when will the sun go down? And only because A.P. Hill arrived was Lee's army saved. But it is at Antietam or Sharpsburg, if you want to look at what the army of Northern Virginia was made of, you will find it there in those hollows and woodlots. And Lee was right. It was the greatest day in the history of his army. Because had they been crushed, he would probably have been destroyed because he fought that battle with a river to his back and no dominant terrain. Fredericksburg, a Confederate soldier will say later, was our easiest battle. Indeed it was. But as I told you before, if you want to find the, the medal of the Army in Northern Virginia someplace, and you can find it at Sharpsburg, you can go to Gettysburg and you look at that long, mile long slope in front of the stone wall at Marine's height, and there you will find what the Army of Potomac was made of. On that cold day, 35,000 men, six and a half divisions of Yankees would ascend that slope. At some points, the gunfire was so intense that the dead were moving because of being struck by so many bullets and the live were coming after them. This is where the Army of Potomac and Courage went together. Their problem, of course, was is who they were led by. The Army of Potomac only ever wanted a fair fight on a fair field, and they're going to have to await that. What about Chancellorsville? I know I'm going through these campaigns, but to give you an idea of it. Oh, by the way, though, I'm sorry. Fredericksburg, Lee was not pleased. Oh, he was pleased with the victory. But what did it get him? And that's what he wrote about. The Yankees go back across the river. When the time comes, they're coming back. And there'll probably be more, though. You know, it's a Pyrrhic victory in his mind because he, he could not get at them. There was no way, you know, Jackson wanted to counterattack, you know, on that day, but, you know, Stafford Heights across the river and all that Yankee cannon, that sort of dismissed that idea. And Chancellorsville, in a sense, folks, will be the same thing. Now, Chancellorsville is arguably uh, Lee's greatest battle by historians and everybody. He confronts twice his number. He divides his army. You have Jackson's famous uh, flank march. Uh, that crushes the 11th Corps, and Lee will, uh, on May the 3rd, Lee will attack and unite the wings of his army and pretty much 
the Federals are beating the Chancellorsville. By the way, I just interject, I, Jeb Stewart, who is a fascinating man, uh, his, maybe his best day in the war was May 3rd, 1863. By the way, he was Jackson's best friend in the Army. They're so disparately, personally, just uh, so much on alike, except for certain things. They were devoted to the cause. They respected each other as soldiers, and they were both deeply committed Christians. And uh, they have this odd, odd relationship. It's not unlike anything else in the uh, Army. And it's ironic that, you know, the steward who gets the message about a little after midnight uh, on May the 3rd that uh, you are now in command of your old friend's uh, second corps. And Stuart will have about four hours to figure out what's going on in those woods around Chancellorsville in the wilderness and put together an attack. He gets, he gets two orders from Lee and says, you will attack at first light because we need to unite the army. And Stuart rides forth that day and it's not, he doesn't perform any brilliant uh, tactical maneuvers. He just rides along the line, uh, cheering the men on. One point he's singing, oh, Joe Hooker, won't you come out the wilderness? Won't you come out the wilderness? And the men are cheering him and all that. It's a great day for a great soldier. He had a veneer, carefully crafted. Stuart wanted to be, a, you know, I wrote it. The Confederacy needed a knight, and Jeb Stuart needed to be that knight. But if you look at that cloak and that plumed hat and that, you're, you're missing the point. Jeb Stuart was a consummate professional soldier. I think the finest light cavalryman the Civil War ever produced. But then we moved and Jackson's death was, uh, folks, it's irreparable. You can't replace Jackson. Lee had already talked a little bit about forming three corps and now he, circumstances made certain that he did that. And he would head north. If you read Lee's report on Gettysburg, you would think that he is taking the boys north to have a good time in Pennsylvania. We're going to sort of vacation there. You know, if we happen to meet the Yankees, we'll fight them. But if we don't, we won't. Uh, I will tell you, they had a good time. I'm, my wife are native Pennsylvanians. Um, the Cumberland Valley is just the Shenandoah Valley across the Potomac River. It's so fertile. Uh, the the Johnny Rebs thought that they had died and going to heaven with all the food. Uh, Dorsey Pender wrote back, I think, a telling thing. Dorsey Pender, uh, division commander now, wrote to his wife, the folks in Pennsylvania are people of barns and not brains. Uh, we're proud of our barns in Pennsylvania. Uh, they're wonderful barns. And, uh, you know, <laughs> in fact, I will tell you, some of, I'm a German, Pennsylvania Dutchman, if you will. Uh, I'm not related to those down there. But anyhow, uh, some of them believed in hexing, if you don't know that, and they would stand in the gate of their house, and as the Confederates marched by, they, they hexed them to keep them out of chicken houses. It did not work. But anyhow, uh, that's not why Lee went to Pennsylvania. The campaign to Gettysburg was a reckoning. Lee was taking the, his army there to end it. Please keep in mind there's a critical difference before. Pennsylvania is free soil. Pennsylvania is the home of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which in those days mattered a lot to the American people. Kids in school knew that. And so he's taking them there. In fact, if you read his letters to Davis in June, they're talking about the, the political situation in the North and the attitude of the Northern people. I mean, he has just strung together in a year. Look what they just did. These victories after victories, and now Chancellorsville. Remember, after Chancellorsville, Lincoln said, my God, my God, what will the country say? And Lee's taking them north to settle it. Now, he did not want to fight the battle on July the 1st. His army was not concentrated, but it was handed to him. And uh, one of the few cases in the war for Lee, his men outnumbered uh, the Federals on the field and they destroyed the 1st and 11th Corps of the Army of Potomac, killed John Reynolds, a very popular general, and moved towards, well, they controlled the town of Gettysburg. And then they will all, uh, go on the attack on July 2nd and come close. I'm not going to go through the controversies of Gettysburg because there's too, there's too many of them. We'd be here three hours. Uh, 
everybody keeps fighting the Battle of Gettysburg over. All I will tell you in the words of James Longstreet in July the 2nd, his men did the best three hours of fighting the troops ever could. Given the circumstances, given the ground, they came awful close. In some ways, the First Corps, those Georgians and Mississippians and South Carolinians and Texans and Alabama, they were, jacks, uh, they were these shock troops. And they're going to sweep across that field, and they're almost going to do it. And I know if any of you have gone to Gettysburg, I used to take my students there. I live about two hours north of there, and we always make a field trip down. I always took the students out to uh, Alexander's Guns, if you will, there in front of the magnificent Virginia Monument. And you look across that ground, and you think, why? Uh, Moxie Sorrell, Longstreet's chief of staff, said Lee had to make that attack. And he's probably right. Now, one thing I should tell you to keep in mind, Pickett's charge, and I'll use that word, it's a common one. Uh, Lee uh, planned to use Pickett early that morning to resume the attack of July 2nd. Well, Longstreet, and if he's a fault for anything there, he did not send the order to Pickett to have his division on the field at daylight break. So what happens is Lee has to patch together a new attack, and that new attack will become Pickett's charge. And so he does. And, you know, if you walk that and you think about it, and I don't think they had a chance, because Lee's plan was predicated on taking arguably his weakest arm, his artillery, not because of the men who manned the gun, but because of the type of guns he had, the ammunition he had, against clearly the strongest arm, the Army of Potomac, and that was their artillery under one of the heroes of Gettysburg, if you look at it that way, and that was Henry Jackson Hunt. So Lee had to believe that they could do that. And think about that. They had come so far together, and there it was, on that ridge, ahead of them. And he was going to make that last one attempt to do it. A couple of things he didn't understand. I told you earlier that the Battle of Gettysburg was a reckoning. It was on both sides. The Army of Potomac came onto that field and they knew what was at stake. All you need to do is read the letters and diaries. Not only was it a reckoning for them, it was a uh, search for redemption. And when they saw Lee's men that afternoon of July the 3rd appear, suddenly as if they rose out of the ground, they're standing up there. And I know if you watch the movie Gettysburg, they're going to yell Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg after the attack. No, they're yelling Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg before as they see him coming. In fact, one Union soldier in the Second Corps stood up and said, come on, come on, come to death. These boys have been slaughtered in the West Woods. They had charged up at Fredericksburg. This was their chance. They're probably the best corps in the Union Army, the Second Corps. And the fact of the matter is, had Lee broken through, had his men broken through, they would have been seeing the vanguard of roughly 13,500 troops who were under orders to move to any section of the line where there's a break that morning. We always forget about the other side in this. Remember, it was John Mosby who told a Confederate veteran who was going after the war listing all the reasons why they lost to Gettysburg, and Mosby says, well, I think the Union Army had something to do about it. <laughs> and they did, they did, and that says, and you read them. There's a wonderful quote that a surgeon in the Army wrote afterwards. There's a lot of truth in it. He was 154th New York. He wrote it, I think, a day after Lee's army crossed back into Virginia. And he ended his letter to his wife with this sentence. This army, meaning the Army of Potomac, this army is an anomaly. It is an army of lions commanded by jackasses. <laughs> but Gettysburg, ironically, there were less of those latter. Finally, the Army of Potomac got leadership that they deserved. See, the one thing about Chancellorsville that Lee could not have known is he did not defeat the Army of Potomac at Chancellorsville. He defeated its commander, Joe Hooker. So the army that he meets at Gettysburg is an army ready to prove their worth. But if you look back on it, he's, of course, we tend to look back at Gettysburg and pick his charge.
and we think of Lee, and historians have argued that Lee has taken, always took the bloodiest road. In fact, he had, yes, he, in this period of time we're talking about, he suffered somewhere like 90,000 casualties. He will have more uh, field officers killed, wounded, and captured than, than any other army in the Confederacy, in fact, about half of them. But he expected aggressiveness. He inflicted in that period of time 97,000 casualties. I've read where one of the favorite things is to compare Lee and the number of casualties he sustained to Grant. And but the problem with that is they throw in Grant in the West. Of the 12 bloodiest battles in the war, nine of them are in the East. The three in the West, Grant's only had one of them. So if you're going to compare Lee and Grant like we like to compare things, you compare Lee and Grant head to head. The Army of Potomac, in, during the Overland Campaign, in those six weeks, if you will, in May and June of 64, will lose more men than they did at Antietam, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg combined. Some will say that Lee's greatest moment and his army's greatest moment was that the fight, defensive fight that they put up there. I would think, though, as you look back in this period of 13 months as we're talking about, and the war is going to change after Gettysburg and Lee's not going to have the offensive weapon he did. But if you weigh, okay, Lee, it costs the Confederacy these men. But look what this army does. It changes the war. It gives the Confederacy a chance to win the war. You don't see it anywhere else. And that's what you have to look at. Oh, you can speculate in this and that. But no American army facing those odds that changed the course of a war so, and nearly won, it's a record that's not, no, no American army has, has equaled that record in this period of time. Lee and the army came to embody Confederate nationalism. The hopes of the Confederate people rested with them. When Lee surrendered at Appomattox, the war's over to the Confederate people. It didn't matter what Joe Johnson did. It didn't matter what they did in Texas or Trans-Mississippi. It is Lee's army. And that's what happens in this period of time. Even, you know, folks, if you look back on it, in August of 64, Lincoln gathered his cabinet, made him sign on, read a letter saying you will support the next administration. Because Lincoln thought that he could not be reelected. But then, of course, things change, beginning with Atlanta. But Lee had driven them to a stalemate, a bloody stalemate, and his political fortunes were sinking, which he's each passing week in the East. But it is in this period of time we were talking about, from the time Lee took command to Gettysburg, where the possibilities were very real, real excuse me, of attaining Confederate independence. I think, and I say this, I think figuratively and literally, I think that the Army of Northern Virginia was reborn on a June Sabbath in 1862. Thank you. questions and answers right now. We do have a microphone so that um, we're recording this so we can hear your questions as well as Mr. Wirt's answers. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I noticed you didn't mention Cold Harbor. Can you address Cold Harbor and, in terms of casualties on the Union side? Uh, the question is, uh, I didn't mention Cold Harbor in June of 64, right? And casually, it is a misnomer, and we, uh, Gordon Ray is uh, really what I think is a magisterial study of the Overland Campaign pretty well shows that Grant did not lose 7,000 men in 30 minutes. He probably lost 7,000 men over a course of a day. Many of the Union soldiers went to ground. And what I mean by that, they just, 
when they were given the order, they sort of started up there and, uh, and stopped. I'll be honest about it, I, I did a book on the Stonewall Brigade and the Iron Brigade, and I took them through the war together. Iron Brigade was a remarkable Yankee outfit, but when it came to the 64 campaign, they went to ground twice. And what happens is, it shows you, when you ask men to do so much so often, there's a point where they can't do anymore. And that, that happens to the best, and I'm, and I'm telling you, the best in the Army of Potomac was the Union Iron Brigade. Of the five regiments in Lee's Army that suffered the greatest number of casualties for them fought those boys. So that just tells you, but that, I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. In uh, Robert E. Lee, the Southerner, uh, Thomas Nelson Page, my book, and at the end, uh, he puts together some uh, statistics, <coughs> what's the line of memorized, but he says much of what you just said, that if you begin Counting the casualties in the Army of the Potomac with the point where Grant meets Lee, uh, and you can find out that uh, whatever the arm, strength of the Army of the Potomac was when they first met in the 130, 140,000, by the time of Appomattox, the Army of Northern Virginia has killed to a man every member, in other words, by the statistics, every member of the Army of the Potomac. The problem with the Army of the Potomac is that. When Lee's men die, they stay dead, and the Army of the Potomac is like fighting wars because they keep reinforcing the Grand Rapids. But the argument was that if Grant had been held to the same strictures as Lee, uh, the entire Army of the Potomac, 130, 140,000 men, had been destroyed uh, during, during the whole period that they faced Lee. Well, you're right. Uh, in fact, uh, you could make a case that during the Appomattox campaign, the best troops in the Union Army were the cavalry. Because, uh, as I told you, the Army of Potomac that we think about at Antietam and Chancellorsville, Frederick, they died in the wilderness in Spotsylvania, North Anna, and Cold Harbor. Uh, but to quote a Confederate on July 2nd, 1863, in Longstreet's Corps, as he's there charging across the wheat field, I think he said, my God, do we have the universe to fight? because more Yankees just kept coming. And that's what happens. But uh, yeah, I, the argument that he says what Lee should have done is adopt a passive defensive and fight a defensive battle. Well, you can't always do that. Folks, if you look at his record of attacks, more times than not in the major battles I talk about, he's on the defensive. Yeah, but, we, we, but everything seems to be framed around Pickett's Charge and Malvern Hill. And there are anomalies in some senses with Lee. Though a case can be made, if you don't know it, the first time the Army of Northern Virginia, the Army of Northern Virginia together, is driven from a field of battle that they defend is April 2nd, 1865. And in a week they're gone. So if you think about that, no, they never. So if you do attack these boys, uh, you're probably not going to drive them. So, but that's what historians, but, well, yeah. I don't know, you, it's like you want to prove his point, but why don't we just look at what happened? That's the way I look at it. They could have tried, they could have won the war. And that, well, that's what he's supposed to do. Hear the question? I'll, I'll give it just a converse to this uh, good friend. I know he's spoken here, Gary Gallagher. Gary just came out with a book last year called The Union War. It's an excellent book. It explains why Yankees fought, and he argues that they fought to restore the Union. And there, you're hearing this hue and cry that's, oh, no, 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 you know, that's why they did. You know, you read them. 
Samuel Moore, he was a lawyer from Berryville, Virginia, goes into Second Virginia. And what struck me a couple things. He goes in in April 61, and in two weeks, the Yankees go from fellow Americans to invaders. <laughs> and it's the same tone, but he wrote to his son to explain why he was away from you know, them and their mother. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that I'm here to protect your mother and you from the, the enemy who's going to come into Virginia and burn our homes and things like that. Most Southern boys, it is that idea. I think Shelby Foote said it far better than I did because he sells, said it simply, but there's a lot of truth to that. And they also did, they did see themselves, so did the Yankees though, it, it is a curious thing. Uh, they saw themselves as uh, the legitimate heirs of the revolution. Southern boys were fighting for liberty and independence. Northerners were, in a sense, fighting for the country that was created from the revolution. Many Northerners, I'll be honest with you, many federal soldiers simply could not believe why the Confederacy seceded. They couldn't understand that. As one of them said, this is the best place on earth for the common man. And that's what they fought for, to save the common man's best place on earth. Where, yes, many of the uh, Confederates, they saw it as the issue of home and defense of home. And I think that's right. In fact, that's one of the reasons some of the men refused to go into Maryland with Lee was because they were, they were leaving the Confederacy. But they didn't have those sentiments in 63 when they had headed north again. Well, I hope I answered your question. Hmm. Could you address uh, Pettigrew's role in the Pickett's Charge? Uh, address Pettigrew's role in Pickett's Charge. Uh, he would uh, form up behind Garnet's Brigade and they would advance. Uh, one of the finest letters I've ever read came from a soldier in Armstead's brigade, 14th Virginia. I wish I would have looked up his name for you. I have to be a farm boy. And uh, he said as they stepped out, and remember they were about 150 yards, I think, beside Garnet. And by the way, Garnet and Kemper, I don't know what a PowerPoint presentation is, so I'm just going to sort of do this. But Gar they had to shift over to close the gap. And Armstead's back here. So they're all shifting this way. But if you go there where they lined up in that hollow there and in the, and as they literally would come out of the ground, it's like they just suddenly appeared to the Federals across the way. But once the Union artillery opened on them and they were hitting everybody, this soldier wrote, and I, in fact, I even titled my one chapter this part of it. He said, arms and legs flew in the air like feathers before the wind. And so Armistead's men will follow and they will push over through there. There's been a dis historic debate over how many Confederate soldiers crossed the Emmitsburg Road. Many of them stayed in the road. I can't blame them. By the way, the road would have been deeper. They think maybe that you would have had a protection of perhaps two feet. You know how the roads wore away in those days. I don't know for sure how many men crossed that second fence but they either were a fool or a brave man, and I would vote for the latter in almost all cases, and they would ascend that slope. And Armistead, more than likely, if you want to, he, at the very end, he may have taken three or 400 men across the stone wall in that final lunge to try to break through. But by then, the Yankees from down on the southern part of the line, they're swarming up. In fact, it gets to the point where there's so many Yankees surrounding them that the ones in the back can't shoot, so they just grab rocks and sort of heave them over, hoping they'll hit somebody. But they're just, they're just swamped. It's over very shortly. And uh, he is not seriously wounded. And he's taken to the rear, and uh, he will die, though, uh, and probably more from physical exhaustion than anything else. Uh, but he is not seriously wounded. His arm and leg. I read the surgeon's report on him. You know, he hasn't been. I hope that's, but that's his role. And uh, by the way, Pickett's been criticized for where he was and where he wasn't. 
Uh, but I think George Pickett did his job. Uh, he rode between Garner's Brigade and Armstead, as far as we know, uh, and probably reached the Emmitsburg Road. His job was to make sure that his men were supported, and by all counts, he sent uh, aides to do that. And of course, uh, but it wouldn't have mattered, in my judgment. Yes. Oh. Was there a tactical victor at Antietam? Tactical victor, you'd have to give it to Lee and his army. But the, the importance of it cannot be denied. Uh, had Lee won there in the sense of driven McClellan from the field, it would have been important. But with Lincoln issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, the war changes in a sense. It certainly makes it far more difficult for Britain to intervene than they were considering it. Uh, but as I was saying about Gary's book, Eventually, the, most of the federal soldiers, they accept the fact of black soldiers in uh, African Americans in the army out of necessity. And, and they, they, I don't know, warm to the emancipation initially, though, but nevertheless, throughout it all, they, they were having to sustain it. But I would, you have to give the tactical, certainly, to Lee, but to strategic, strategically, it was a Union victory because Lee retreated back. When this, it's, uh, Joe Harsh, late Joe Harsh, has written wonderfully on Antietam. I think one thing is called Confederate Tide Rising, and it really was. And if I had to pick between Antietam and Gettysburg as a more profoundly important uh, turning point, I'd pick Antietam in that sense of what happens as a result of it. And actually, Lee's army, they, they thought Vicksburg was far more important than their defeat at Gettysburg. Because they just thought, well, they got whipped once, but they'll whip the Yankees again, so it didn't matter. It's only much later as we look at Gettysburg. Yeah. Wait. Last question. Last question. It seems like in um, reviewing these despite all these, these brilliant victories against the superior forces, he repeatedly failed to close the deal. Uh, didn't uh, annihilate the Yankees North Virginia Army. Didn't capture that parking lot uh, near Manassas. Um, had the Yankees by surprise and, and surrounded the Union full flight. Had a chance with those that sort of last, sort of like a football team getting into the, you know, the 20, the 20 yard line and not getting across the goal. Uh, was that, what do you think about that? Was it weakness on these parties, or was it just the way it went? Uh, did you hear the, everybody hear the question? Uh, it was the way it was. Uh, the only man who arguably came the closest, if not to really destroying an army, was George Thomas in Nashville. Uh, it was simply beyond uh, uh, the abilities of Confederate Army or Union armies, either army, to destroy the other. Grant didn't destroy the uh, Army of Northern Virginia in the climactic, climactic battle. He just bled it to death. And that's what he did. And then when finally they assault in April the 2nd, there's just too few Confederates in the uh, trenches anymore at Petersburg to stop it. So he, he, nobody manages to do that. What I'm saying is Lee's closest ch shot at that actually was 2nd Manassas. But it just doesn't, you know, there are limits to what men do in the fog of war or mistakes that are made. And uh, they're not able to do it. But uh, no, believe me, he tried. And that's what he wanted to do. Because he, he thought that was their only hope of victory, or independence. Well, thank you. I want to thank you all. Well, I want to thank Jeffrey Wirt, and I also want to thank all of you for coming. I want to ask also if you will just sit in your seats for another 30 seconds while I escort the words out so we can take them to lunch. Thank you.